Today we are going to talk about these topics. Number 1. Residual income can be your key to wealth. Number 2. Is it really necessary to create a family budget? Number 3. Tips on finding reputable debt counseling services. Number 4. Why do we need to invest? Number 5. Avoid financial disaster with good planning. Number 1. Are you standing at the door to wealth but can't seem to find the right key? There are many keys on the ring that can unlock the door to wealth, but you have to know which ones they are and how to use them correctly. In this article I'll focus on the residual income key that many have discovered can be used to enter the inner sanctums of the wealthy. But before I go too far, I should probably define what I mean by residual income. While there are perhaps a number of definitions for residual income, I will be using the term here as follows. Residual income is income that continues to be earned after the initial effort has come to an end. In other words, it can be thought of as the process of making a sale one time, but getting paid over and over again. How can this be? That is, how can you make one sale and get paid over and over again? Well, let's take a look at some common examples of residual income. An insurance policy. When you buy an insurance policy, you normally pay premiums monthly, quarterly or annually. You made one purchase, but you continue to pay as long as you maintain your policy. The insurance company earns a residual income from you. A service subscription such as a pest control, lawn maintenance, or web hosting contract. When you purchase a pest control, lawn maintenance, or web hosting service you normally again pay a monthly, quarterly, or annual fee. As long as you continue your service, you continue to pay the fee. The service company earns a residual income from you. A membership subscription such as to a membership website or a club. To continue your membership, you must continue to pay membership fees. The membership entity earns a residual income from you. In all of the above examples, the sale was made only one time, but you continue to pay the company over and over again. Residual income is distinguished from linear income, where a single payment for a single one-time purchase is made. For example, if you have an hourly job, you are exchanging one hour of your labor time for an hourly pay rate. You must work each hour to get paid. If you stop working, you stop getting paid. Your income is linear. However, if you sell memberships to a website and your members pay a monthly fee to belong, then you continue to collect their monthly fees as long as they continue to remain a member. You made the sale one time but continue to collect an income long after the initial sales effort was completed. This is an example of residual income. Which would you rather have, a residual income or a linear income? Generally, whenever possible, you should try to earn a residual income that will continue to grow over time as you make individual sales. If you put in a consistent effort toward earning a residual income, you will find that your income will compound itself as the amount of residual income continues to grow. For example, let's take a look at the difference between selling a $29 book and a membership to a website with a $29 monthly fee. We'll assume that both sellers began their sales effort on the 1st of January and continued the effort for six months. With the sale of each book, the seller earns $29 but then has to make another sale to earn another $29. Hopefully, the seller has some back-end or follow-on products to sell to each customer in the future, but many do not. So each sale stands alone. Let's also assume that the cost to make each sale come to $4 per sale. Our merchant thus earns $25 net per sale. We'll assume that 10 sales are made per month so over the 6-month period he made 60 sales. So for 60 sales, he has earned $1,500. Now, let's take a look at how the membership site might do. Each membership sells for $29 per month and the cost to make each sale is the same $4 per sale so the site owner earns the same $25 net per initial sale. However, he continues to earn the $29 each and every month that the buyer remains as a member and there is no sales cost for the subsequent months. We'll also assume that our membership site makes 10 sales per month and that each buyer remains a member for 4 months on average before dropping their membership. Now let's take a look at the numbers. 
Month 1 equals 10 sales for $250. Month 2 equals 10 sales for $250 plus $290 residual income. Month 3 equals 10 sales for $250 plus $580 residual income. Month 4 equals 10 sales for $250 plus $870 residual income. Month 5 equals 10 sales for $250 plus $870 residual income. Month 6 equals 10 sales for $250 plus $870 residual income the total income for the six months comes to $4.980 plus there is still a continuing income that will come in from sales that were made during months 4, 5 and 6. Which would you rather have, the $1,500 made as linear income or the $4,980 plus earned through sales with a residual income tail? The sales effort was the same. As you can see from the above example, residual income can quickly surpass linear income if your sales effort remains constant. So, keep on the lookout for good residual income opportunities, they can be your key to opening the door to increased wealth. Number 2 The thought of budgeting may seem simple to do, right? However, if we really get into it and try to balance our income and expenses, we realize that it's not that easy to do. Still, Having a budget or spending plan can help us manage our finances better. Money issues, especially within the family, can be a source of relationship conflicts. Dealing with money problems always gives stress. Thus, it is important that we create a budget for the family. And it should not only be you who are going to do it but all of the members of the family should get involved. Each, even young children, should have a say on the family's finances. Step-by-step -step guide here is a guide to help you start making your family's budget. One, Assess your current financial situation. Before starting to write down a budget plan, try to check first your spending patterns for the past year. You may want to take a look at all your utility and other bills for the past year. You would also need a copy of your salary records and income tax return for the past year. In case you do not have copies of your bills anymore, utility companies and other service companies like credit card can give you a record of your transactions or provide an estimate. Two, Design budget outline. There are sample budget outlines found in the internet that you can download and make use of. You can also find some in magazines and books. Utilize these things to create an organized and well-written family budget. Three, Write them down. Once you have all past references to your income and wages, as well as the budget design, you can now start writing down your income, from wages, pensions to tax credits, for the current month. Then write down your expenses for the month, utility bills, credit card bills, and other purchases. Receipts and your checkbook may be good references to find the information. 4. Lifestyle Check You need to check your family's lifestyle and spending patterns. This is where every member of the family should get involved. Think about the important things that each member spends on. Think also of the things that you can probably do without. Five. Plan for next year. Estimate the income and expenses that your family may have for the next year. Your income may remain the same or you can also adjust it if you expect it to change within the year. You also need to take into consideration special occasions where you usually spend on like Christmas, birthdays, Thanksgiving and other holidays. Six. Know your credit standing. You also need to find out your current credit standing. You may request for your credit report from a credit bureau near your area. You can find them listed in the yellow pages. Writing down a family budget will definitely help you realize how wisely you and your family spend money. If you feel that you are spending too much more than what you are getting, then it's high time to start fixing your finances and sticking with your family budget. Saving is also one way to improve your finances. For a family, there should be a substantial amount of savings that you can use in case of emergency. As head of the family, you should impress on your spouse and children the importance of savings. If you can commit your whole family into saving, then most likely, you will not have a problem in sticking with your family budget. Number 3 For the debtor who is already at the end of his rope and trying to figure out how to get out of debt, the last thing he needs to worry about is whether the debt counselor he has chosen to help him is going to make his problems worse. He needs to be assured that he is not making a mistake by choosing debt counseling over bankruptcy or working out a settlement with the creditors. The first thing one should do to gain some certainty that the debt counselor they are planning to choose is reputable is to check with the Better Business Bureau. Of course, 
This isn't a guarantee, since they only have on-file information from people who have filed complaints, so if it's a new company or one who has had no complaints filed against it, you really aren't going to know. Nonetheless, this is the best tool you have, and you should utilize it to the greatest degree possible. Another way to find out the reputation of a debt counseling service is through word of mouth. If the company is reputable, they will not mind providing you with information about other clients. Of course you want to be sure that they are not giving out false or unsolicited information. If they are really reputable, they will likely have something on their application allowing them to release information to other potential clients. If it's a local company, perhaps you even know people who have utilized their services. If they are not willing to give you references you can check, then you're much better off to move forward to someone who is willing to cooperate with you. In most, though not all, cases, refusal to provide references means there is something they are trying to hide, and this is not the kind of person with whom you want to do business. The internet is a wonderful place to search for information on various subjects. And if there is a company of questionable reputation, there is more than likely a forum that has been set up to complain about this company. Strange as it may seem, people on the internet actually set up websites, forums, and groups on Yahoo and MSN to do nothing more than complain about companies they feel have treated them unfairly. Utilize all the tools that are at your disposal, and if it's a local company, be sure you check with all of the local agencies including the Attorney General's office who would know of any illegal activity that has been reported. If you have come this far, you do not have the funds to be taken for a ride, so you want to be very careful to whom you give your money. It's not going to help your situation if the person you choose doesn't do the job they promised to do, and you can't even collect damages in court if they ultimately close down their operation. Choose a company who has been in business long enough to have a record of clientele, and choose one you feel is looking out for your best interests and not just wanting to take your money. Choose a debt counselor as carefully as you would choose a babysitter for your newborn baby. Number 4. It is vitally important in this current day and age for all of us to begin taking control of our financial situation and start planning for our future, and the futures of our children. We can no longer rely on the government to hand out an aged pension once we retire. We cannot take for granted that at the end of our working life we will be taken care of financially. The world population is aging, due to the baby boomer generation, and within 30 years there will be so many retired people, compared to the number of working age people, that it will be economically impossible for the government to afford to provide any reasonable source of monetary assistance for the elderly. The government has realized this. And that is why they introduced the compulsory employer paid superannuation scheme and are even now beginning to give financial incentives to self-funded retirees. Most of us have never sat down and even considered the ramifications of why the compulsory super was introduced and for many of us it is a matter of too little too late. Even for the young women in our society, who have a full working life ahead of them, they still cannot rest assured of a comfortable retirement. Why is this? It is because that unfortunately even with contributions at the current level of less than 10%, someone on an average wage who works continually for 30 years, is still going to find themselves trying to survive on an income equivalent to less than $2,000,000,000 per annum in today's dollars. You will notice that I said continually working for 30 years. This is another reason why women are particularly disadvantaged. Firstly because they often have to take up to 10 years leave from the workforce to raise children, secondly because women in general earn less than their male counterparts and thirdly because an enormous proportion of the women in Australia, for example, will never have received any superannuation contributions prior to the compulsory superannuation being introduced and will therefore not have had contributions made over their entire working life so far, giving them even less to fall back on by the time they retire. Many women may previously not have thought of lack of superannuation contributions as being a problem, as their husbands may have been contributing to super since they first began work. Unfortunately though with the high number of divorces in this country, it is unwise to rely on the fact that your partner's superannuation will be there for you in your retirement years and even if a large proportion is awarded in a settlement, that it will be sufficient to sustain a comfortable retirement for any length of time. All of these factors are why women now more than ever, need to begin taking action to build up a source of ongoing income, that will grow to such an extent, as to be able to provide a secure and happy future for themselves and their children. It needs to be a source of income that is unrelated to physical work.
That is an income that is generated from income producing assets, and not from our personal efforts. One of the best sources of creating this ongoing income stream is to begin building an investment property portfolio, also aptly paraphrased as bricks and mortar. We need to start investing in income producing assets now, so that they will have time to grow and develop so that we will be financially independent for our retirement years. The most important concept to grasp in relation to building wealth for retirement and for creating finances that can be directed toward charities, or helping out your family is that of compound interest. In mathematical terms 72 divided by compound interest rate of return equals years for money to double in value. Therefore if you have $1.000 invested at 10% interest, then the number of years that it will take for your money to double to $2,000 is 7.2. It will quadruple in 14.4 years and be worth 8 times as much in just over 21 years. If your money is invested at 7% interest, then it will take approximately 10 years to double in value. If it is invested at 5% it will double in just over 14 years. The two most important aspects of compounding are 1, rate and 2, time. The higher the rate and the longer the time something is left to compound, the greater the final result will be. This is why the sooner we start investing, the better. Number 5. It's tough to get by financially in today's fast-paced life. With mortgages, car notes and massive amounts of credit card debt, most people struggle to get by from month to month. With most people doing what they can just to pay their bills, few people are prepared for the unlikely event of a financial disaster. They come in many forms. A storm like Hurricane Katrina, a loss of job, or a sudden illness can break anyone who isn't prepared for an unexpected interruption in their financial life. But it isn't all that difficult to make preparations that will help you in times of a money crisis. All it takes is a bit of planning ahead of time. Here are a few things that will help you be prepared for the unexpected. Get an ATM debit card. You may not regularly use cash or have a need for a debit card, but there are some circumstances where it may be necessary. People from New Orleans who were temporarily displaced by Hurricane Katrina would have benefited from having access to cash even while away from home. If you don't use one regularly, get one anyway and keep it in a safe place. Sign up for direct deposit. With direct deposit, you will know that your paycheck will be in your bank account even if you cannot, for whatever reason, physically get to your bank. This will help you in the event of illness or natural disaster that may have your local bank temporarily closed. Sign up for online bill paying. You can pay bills even if you aren't at home via the internet. You don't have to use the service, but it may come in handy at a time when you least expect it. Save some emergency cash. Financial experts recommend that you save at least three months worth of financial expenses. That's difficult, but every little bit can help. Try to cut back on a few unnecessary items, such as that tall latte you buy every day. It adds up, and you never know when you may need to access that emergency cash. Set up a home equity line of credit, unlike a home equity loan, which provides you with a lump sum of cash right away. A home equity line of credit provides you with cash that you can use a little at a time, and only when you need it. If you don't actually take any money out, you don't have monthly payments. But if an emergency strikes, you'll have cash available. This can be particularly helpful if you find yourself out of work for a short period of time. Your bank won't lend you money when you are out of work, so plan ahead of time and the money will be ready when you are. A little bit of planning can go a long way when a financial emergency strikes. If you plan for it now, you will have fewer worries later.